Okay, hi, I'm Nardine from uh, New York, and this is... My name's Anne Queen from Philly. My name's Stephanie from East Brunswick. I'm Daisy from East Brunswick. And I'm Marina from Philly. And we are from all the Orthodox churches in the Tri-State area, I guess. Um, East Coast, yeah, so we're here at the ECCYC. Um, it's really awesome. We just had uh, the blessing of Emba Tomes and Emba David, and it's been a really um, spiritually benefiting retreat. Um, I don't know, did you guys like it? How was the food and stuff? Everything was good, the fellowship was great, and as you can see, we always made amazing friends from different places. My favorite part of this retreat is just so many, man. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's indescribable, and uh, but in terms of something that I can describe, that's my favorite part. Is that uh, okay? Uh, the fellowship, the fellowship. It's good. Thanks a lot, Anthony. All right, thank you. Right. Thank you so much, and we'll see you guys soon. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and has given us to everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. To him we lift up our hearts and place in today's service between his hands so through his grace, Bishop Thomas is in prayers and so through he may give grace the opening of the mouth that the word that is spoken may be for the salvation of our souls and the edification of his church. To him is to all glory and honor now and forever and ever. I mean. So this one, this talk is, spoke, is about a dynamic Christian life. So this is our solar system. Okay, does it, by the way, does anybody know what this, the name of our solar system is? Milky Way. That's the galaxy. <laughs> does anybody know? I learned this when I was preparing this. It's actually called Sol, S-O-L. Yeah, that's the name of the solar system. Huh? Yeah. Exactly. But anyway, getting, getting to the point here. Getting to the point. The solar system has a system. It has a system to it. It has an order to it. The sun is at the center, and all the planets, they revolve around the sun. And the result of that is that it creates stability to all the planets. We'll speak about Earth in, for in particular. It gives light. It gives heat, it gives stability, and it allows for life to exist on Earth. Because the sun is at the center, and everything else revolves around it. So we said the sun is at the center, the planets move around it, and it creates conditions of stability, heat, light, it allows for life. However, the planets, they're still in continuous movement and activity. So it's kind of stabilized by their relationship with the sun at the center. But the planets are still in constant movement, constant activity. For us, our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the sun, the S-U-N of righteousness. So extending this from the physical to the spiritual, our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the son of righteousness. And as Malachi 4, 2, he says, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. So he becomes our center. He becomes our sun. He becomes our stability. So therefore, he becomes my light. He becomes my warmth. He becomes my stability. Therefore, he is the center of my life. However, just like the planets around the sun, I still need to have constant growth constant movement, constant activity, and it's all a result of being founded in Him. Him being the center. Him being the Son of Righteousness. There's different ways of saying this in the Holy Bible. For example, He's the Alpha and the Omega. He says, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. And He says this several times in Revelation, not just in this verse. He becomes everything for us. He becomes not just the center, he becomes the first, the last, and everything in between as well. He becomes everything for me. And St. Paul, he says this in maybe a little different way. In Romans 11, he says, Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So what does this mean? 
this verse has a lot of meanings on different levels, but for our purposes, it means that he is my life. I came from him, he gave me life, he sustains my life, and therefore I should give my life to him, to whom is due all the glory. So when giving my life to him means what? Giving him my mind, giving him my thoughts, my emotions, my heart, my deeds, my material things, everything is his. Everything belongs to him. So I take everything and I put it in his hands for him to sanctify. For this to happen, I need to be one with him. As we heard several times over this, this week and especially yesterday from his grace, Bishop Tomas. We say this every liturgy. You may realize it or not. In the prayer for the gospel, what do we say? For you are the life of us all, the salvation of us all, the hope of us all, the healing of us all, and the resurrection of us all. So in this prayer for the gospel, he says, for you the life of us all, the salvation of us all, the hope of us all, the healing of us all, and the resurrection of us all. Man, that means he's everything. And all of it is in him personally. In him personally. You remember the prayer that Simeon the elder said when Christ was brought into the temple in the, his 40th day, the 40th day from his birth. And Simeon the elder was holding him in his hands and he said, Lord, now you're letting servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. When he was carrying Christ and he saw him, he called Christ his salvation. He, in him is salvation. So if in him is salvation, for me to have salvation, I have to be one with him. I have to be united to him. I have to be one with him to have the life and the salvation and the hope and the healing and the resurrection in the last day. This union with Christ is on different levels. There's a sacramental level or a mystical level for lack of a better term, which is through the mysteries and the sacraments of the church. It's how I, it, for example, when you take a branch and you connect it to the vine, he is the true vine. Any branch that's cut from a tree cannot live. It cannot survive. Therefore, for us to live, we need to be attached to him, for him to nourish us. But on the same, on the same note, there's another level of union with him, which is my daily struggle in this life, my daily relationship with him, which is not sacramental level. We'll call it the spiritual level. The constant struggle with the grace of the Holy Spirit throughout my life to the very end. And I have to have faith that he is the beneficent God. We say this, again, we use these phrases and we don't think about them when we pray them on a daily basis. We say, let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God. The Father. We say it as if it's a, you know, we say it very repetitively. But do I really believe that he is the beneficent God? The one who does good for me, the one who provides every good thing for me. In the psalm it says, the eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. And pay attention here. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. He is the one who takes care of all of us. And we say it daily in our prayers, but do we re realize it? That he is the one who provides every good thing for me. Not just material things. This is the end of the scale. But he provides for me his fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, to the very end. He gives me every grace and virtue. For example, when he says, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. He gives me every strength and encouragement. He gives me every good thing. And for me to have those things, I need to be one with him, united to him. As it says in the epistle of St. James, every good thing, gift, and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. It is the sin that separates us from him. God wants us to be one with him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants to give us every good thing, and this is of his nature, because he is the beneficent God. But the reality is we're the ones who separate ourselves from him. And this is what it says in Isaiah 59. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. He wants to save us. 
However, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. This is exactly what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. They enjoyed being in the garden. They enjoyed being in God's presence. They enjoyed being active and productive in tending and working in the garden. And Adam was naming the animals. They, enjoy, they enjoyed being there in that whole situation. But when the sin entered with the sin, this relationship became disturbed. They ran away. They felt separated. They were ashamed. This was the situation. One of the most frustrating phrases that you hear from people is, I want to live life to its fullest. You tell me. Live, li I want to live life to its fullest. I want to live my life. I just want to live my life. And living my life means so many different things. But typically, it means when people say it, it's because they want to, don't want to have any responsibility. They want to, don't want to take their life seriously. I just want to live my life. Whatever, maybe they, whatever it is. But this is based on wrong perceptions of what life is. We just agreed that the only real life is a life with Christ. We have wrong perceptions. We have some perception that God is only present when I call upon Him. And not that He's there all the time, irrespective of if I call upon Him or not. We have a perception that many times we look for all the things that we need in this life in the world. We look for happiness in the world. We look for happiness or some sort of joy in, re in relationships, whether they be appropriate or inappropriate. We look for happiness and wealth. We look for happiness and many different things in the world. And then we realize that we can't find it anywhere except with Christ himself. Our emotions become misdirected. And we become distracted in this life, putting our emotions and our feelings into things of the world which cannot give us any satisfaction whatsoever, except for something very temporary. And it's misdirected because I cannot find this true happiness if it's not founded in God himself. So therefore, to live my life to its fullest, truly, it has to be through a connection with Christ, who is life. How can I live life to its fullest and have this dynamic Christian life as we're speaking about if it's not founded in Christ himself? Therefore, for it to be founded in him, one of the things that needs to happen is I need to have constant prayer continuously being connected with him, speaking with him, seeking his direction, and both what we call the big and the small things. Sometimes we only speak to God when something, whatever our perception of when something big happens, something important is going to happen. Then all of a sudden, God, where are you? God, help me. I need you. Direct me. But in everything that preceded that, for some reason, we ignore him, thinking that we can take care of things on our own, which is wrong. I should have included him in every step in my life, every thought, every action, every deed, everything, before we got to the big things. The reality is, contrary to the wrong perceptions that we have, the reality is, is that he's always there. God is ever-present. And it's this concept that supports us and comforts us and he gives us a defense and also present prevention from sin. And he promised the disciples, he said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He's always there. Our problem is, is we don't seek him. So therefore, we need this constant movement. We need this constant growth. We need this constant relationship and connection with Christ. Although we receive the grace of this mystical or sacramental union through the sacraments and the mysteries of the church, we have to constantly struggle all the time to remain and grow in that relationship with Him. I need to remain attached and nourished as the brand. It's kind of like in school. You know, there's two grading systems, at least that I know of. Maybe there's some teachers here that know better than I do. But there's two types of grading systems. The first one is you start off with zero, and whatever grades you get afterwards is what makes up your, your grade at the, over the semester 
or your class. The other teaching system, or the other grading system, is you start off with an A. You start off with an A and you have to maintain it, which is probably more difficult than just building up your grade over time. That's what happened to us at baptism. At baptism, we received an A. We received the top grade. And from that time, we have to maintain it. We have to maintain our purity. We have to maintain our connection, our relationship with Christ. And part of this, or actually this occurs through the gift of the Holy Spirit and confirmation. In the anointing prayers of confirmation, when Abuna is anointing the newly baptized with the Holy Meron, in the prayers he says, a deposit or a down payment for the, for the eternal life. A down payment for the eternal life. So when you make a down payment for something, what is intended afterwards? If you make a down payment for something, what do you have to do afterwards? Installments. You have to pay installments afterwards, right? So when you make a down payment for something, you need to continue to invest. You need to continue to work and to struggle and to keep doing your part. This is the constant movement, the constant growth that needs to happen from the very beginning. And this is related to what our Lord Jesus Christ said in this prayer in John 17, verse 3. He says, and this is eternal life. He gives an equation here. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Why is this related to our topic of constant movement? Because if eternal life is knowing God, this knowledge is the relationship and experience with God, growing in learning and understanding the mysteries, and in our life with God. And if God is eternal, God is unlimited, God is without boundary, then will there be any end to this knowledge? There will be no end. We'll continue to learn, continue to grow in this knowledge for eternity. But we have to set our priorities straight. We need to have the right priorities. St. John, in his third epistle, he writes, Behold, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Here, nobody is saying that you shouldn't be successful in, in work and in school and some social things. But it has to be put in perspective. It has to be put in perspective. It comes secondary. It's not first. Yes, he wants him to prosper in those things, but it comes after the prosperity of the soul. The prosperity of the soul comes first. And this is why our Lord Jesus Christ, he says in the Sermon on the Mount, but seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. And he says that also in Matthew 16, he says, for what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I have to set my priorities right. Many times we know these facts, we know these, the details behind the, everything we're saying. But when it comes to the reality, where are our priorities? What do I set first? Do I set first the kingdom of heaven? Do I set first Christ and everything that I'm doing? Or am I setting my own desires and the things of this world? We should be following the good shepherd. It says the good shepherd is known by his sheep. And the sheep, they follow the good shepherd because they know his voice. They hear his voice. They know him. And they distinguish him apart from all the other voices. So they follow him. They know their priority. They know who they're supposed to follow. And they know their job, that they're just supposed to follow, not supposed to lead or do things on their own. No. They're supposed to follow the good shepherd. So there needs to be constant growth. There's many different examples of this in the Bible. For example... The ten virgins. In, this, in the parable of the ten virgins, we know there were five wise and there were five foolish. And the five foolish weren't called foolish because they didn't have oil. It wasn't because they didn't have oil. They all had oil. But the five foolish virgins were foolish because they didn't have extra. They didn't have it in their vessels along with, what, along with their lamps. And this is why they were foolish. They were foolish because they didn't take into consideration that there might be a delay. 
They thought that they had enough. And this is a problem that we have in our life. We don't continue to grow. Our life is not dynamic, constantly living in Christ and growing in Him. We think that we have enough and we stop somewhere. Or we're satisfied and that's it. But notice that they were called foolish. They weren't called uh, lazy. They weren't called um, inefficient. or what. They, weren't, they were called foolish. They were called foolish because they thought that what they had was enough. Also in Second Peter, for chapter 1, he says, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, all the way until, until love. We keep adding, we keep growing, we keep moving in this dynamic life in our relationship with Christ. St. Paul, he speaks about, about this himself as well. St. Paul, and he wrote the epistle to the Philippians when he was in jail. This is towards the end of his life. When he was in prison, he writes this about his constant struggle, that he's still struggling, he's still working, he's still seeking for the kingdom of heaven. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may hold of, of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, whoever has this idea is the mature person. This is the mature way of thinking. The one who keeps struggling, the one who keeps working, the one who keeps seeking the goal, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he also speaks of an athlete running a race. There's other examples of this, even though we may not realize it. Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, therefore you shall be perfect. You shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now why does he set an example for us that's impossible? Why does he set a standard for us that we can never reach? Why do you think? So we'll continue to grow. We keep trying to struggle to reach that goal. It's to continue a struggle towards, towards perfection through his grace. So that we never end struggling. We never end working towards the perfection of Christ. Again, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the pure in heart. Is anybody absolutely pure, 100% perfect? Is anyone 100% perfect? No, it's impossible. There's no one who's absolutely good, absolutely righteous, except God himself. There is none who is good but one who is God. So any of those things in the world, are they compatible? Is anything in the world, any of the standards of this world, are they compatible with this purity in heart? The standard that Christ gives us in the Sermon on the Mount. We need to think about these things. Let's take it from another angle. This is the diamond, all right? Yeah, yeah. it's a diamond. Everybody woke up now. Oh, it's a diamond. Okay, it's a diamond. Yes, it's a diamond. Our faith is like a diamond. Our faith is like a diamond. Many times when we think about our Christianity, our life with Christ, we think about it in different categories. We think about, okay, here's theology and here's spirituality, as if they were two different subjects. And then one time we speak about love, another time we speak about baptism, and the third time we speak about the Eucharist, another time we speak about the Holy Trinity, and the next time we speak about some social issues, whatever. But they're not separate. They're all still the same diamond. When you look at a diamond, the way that you turn it, the way that you turn that diamond, you see it differently, right? Based on the facets and the way it shines in the light and these sorts of things. But in the end, what is it still? It's still all the same diamond. Our faith is the same thing. It's all the same diamond. They're not separate from each other. In fact, they're one and the same thing. For those who know the answer to this question, because I, I ask this a lot. What was the greatest theological school that ever existed? This is related to this topic, by the way. I don't, I'm not going off track. What is the greatest theological school that ever existed? For those who have never heard me ask this question before. What do you think? What is it? 
No, I didn't hear you. Where Jesus taught the apostles. Okay, so it's Christ with the disciples. The greatest theological school that ever existed in the history of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ with the disciples. What are the characteristics of this school? Who is the professor? God himself. Not some theologian, some, somebody who spent a few years in school and wrote a dissertation and now he's a professor. No. God himself was the teacher. The disciples didn't just go for an hour or two and then left and had some fun. No. They went and they spent night and day with him for three and a half years. They spent all their time with him. They heard his words and his teachings. They saw his behavior in different circumstances. They witnessed his miracles. They experienced his dealings with themselves. It was a constant absorbing of who Christ is. And then he sent them on internships and co-ops. Right? He sent, them, he sent them two by two. Right? And then they would go. They would experience something. And then they would come back and they would give some sort of feedback or debriefing. Right? And then he would either give them positive or negative feedback. So for example, when, they, when he sent out the 70, and they came back and they were so happy, he said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he told them what? He told them what? Do not rejoice in this. That it, rather rejoice that what? Your names are written in heaven. So he gave them feedback. There were some times where they failed. There were some times they were unsuccessful. For example, when they tried to cast out the demon, and then he rebuked them, but in the end he gave them why they weren't able to. He says, this kind cannot come out except by, by prayer and fasting. Sometimes they failed, sometimes they didn't succeed, but they learned from those failures. In fact, St. Peter, he, he received probably one of the greatest criticisms in the entire Bible. When he told him, get behind me, Satan. But St. Peter, he learned from that. He learned from that experience, and he continued to follow Christ, and he remained in that school. Where is the school now? This school continues through the church by discipleship. Our fathers, the apostles, they were disciples. They were with him night and day. They absorbed, they were, they were unified with him in the, two, in the different ways that we, that we mentioned. But it was a constant relationship with him. As he told them, he said, Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then he told them to go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And then, as we hear from the teaching of St. Paul to St. Timothy, he told him, he said, Go and teach others who will be able to teach others after them. It's all by discipleship. It's this carrying of this diamond, this diamond, our faith, from one generation to the next through discipleship. The apostles did the same thing. St. John, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled. It's a very uh, expressive way of saying that we were with him. But it wasn't just being with him. It was very personal very personal for them and that personal relationship they wanted to relay to those they were going to make disciples after them very personal relationship in order to manifest to them eternal life and the joy and the truth and the fellowship with christ and saint paul he continues with the same thing imitate me why because i'm a great guy no imitate me just as i also imitate christ the same thing and he says that afterwards in Philippians, when he says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. Here he's not talking about just some spirituality. He's speaking about their whole life in Christ, including the Eucharist, including the sacraments, including a way of life day to day. And this is what we need to do, paying attention to ourselves first. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Pay attention to yourself first. And then you can worry about other people. So we're supposed to carry this image of Christ. The whole package. That diamond. 
How do we do this? Let's mention a few things. St. Paul, he speaks about speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Yes, we're supposed to speak the truth. Some people take one half of this and leave the other. They believe that love does not include truth, or they speak in truth and they forget about the love part of it, and it doesn't matter what the other person thinks. What we're supposed to do is speak the truth in love. You're supposed to be grounded in Christ. Expose that diamond. Share it with other people. But the whole diamond, not part of it. Both sides of it. Because part of that truth is love, and God is love. And they have to see that part of it, or else you're not exposing the whole thing. They're only seeing one side of it, which is very misleading. And sometimes this verse, we take the first part, and we forget about the second part. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give offense, a, de a defense, not give offense, to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And we stop there and we forget the rest of it. So people think we're supposed to go and start you know, proclaiming and you know, testifying and saying all sorts of things to other people. And it doesn't matter how we say it. No, it does matter. Why? Because the rest of the verse is what? With meekness and fear. Meekness is the opposite of anger. With gentleness. With gentleness. With humility. Showing Christ, showing the image of Christ in what we're defending. You say the truth, but you say it the right way. You present Christ in the whole package, the whole diamond. We're, salt of the, we're supposed to be salt of the earth. Salt, you taste it. It gives flavor and it, gives, it preserves things. But you don't see it when it's dissolved or when it's in the food itself. That's what we're supposed to be like in the world. And in fact, we would hear stories in the early church how someone who wasn't Christian, and they would meet a Christian, and the family saw that there was some change in their behavior. And they would say, did you meet a Christian today? Why? Just that exposure. The exposure and seeing something new in Christ. Some of you may have heard of um, a, a modern-day saint. He passed away in the 70s. His name is Abu Mikhail Ibrahim. He was the father of confession of His Holiness Pope Shenouda and many of the, the leaders of our church, and some today as well. And the one of Mikhail, when he was still, uh, before he was ordained a priest, he was Mikhail Effendi, and uh, his supervisor was not Christian. And uh, he liked Mikhail Effendi a lot. So he told him, he says, you know, he says, you know, I like you a lot except for one thing. He said, what's that? He says, I like you a lot except for you're being Christian. He said, so what do you like about me? He said, you're honest, and you're faithful in your work, and you're hardworking, and you're this and this. He started laying out all his nice virtues. So Mikhail Effendi told him, he said, if you take Christ away from me, you wouldn't have any of those things. This is the reality. This is the whole picture. This is the whole image, the whole diamond. You take both sides, theology and spirituality, and, and, they, and they meet together in my whole life. Another example. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law. What's the law of Christ? The law of Christ here is He bore my burdens. He bears my burdens. So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to be in that image. I'm supposed to bear others' burdens. But in the end, who's carrying all of our burdens? Christ is carrying all of them. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Try and see the good things. Look at things in a pure way. In a good way. This is what God tries to do for us. God isn't standing there with a red marker and, you know, the red pen and saying he did this and this and this and this and this and this and this. He's trying to get us to repentance. He's trying to get us to holiness, to purity, to live a life with him. So he says to the pure, all things are pure. To look at things in the right way. Try to see the good in other people. Always seeking their good. There's a nice story in the... In the Paradise of the Fathers, of St. Macarius the Great. It's a very nice story. He says, it says in the story that St. Macarius was with, with, with his disciple, and the disciple was walking a little bit ahead of him. And this disciple, he encountered a, a pagan priest. So the disciple, when he saw the pagan priest, he started saying a lot of nasty things to him. 
So the priest took offense to it and he beat him up. So then, St. Macarius comes on and he encounters the same priest. And of course this priest, he sees that they're, you know, they look the same and they're just the same and this sort of thing. So St. Macarius, what does he say to this priest? He says, you're very strong. You're very uh, athletic. You're very, these sorts of things. So the priest was taken aback. And he, just, and he knew that St. Macarius had just seen that he beat up his disciple. You know, he, he beat up this guy. He said, what are you saying? He said, yes, yes, no, 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 you're very strong. You're very, uh, very courageous. Very... He started saying all these nice things about him. He said, why are you saying all this to me? So St. Macarius took it from there, and he started to describe where he got these words from, that he got it from Christ. Eventually, this man became a Christian and ended up becoming a monk as well. Try to see the good. That being said, none of this excuses the sin. It is not an excuse for the sin. In our day and time, the word love is misused all the time. It's misused. And it's portrayed the wrong way. As if love has nothing to do with the truth. As if, as if love excuses the sin and excuses the wrongdoing. But that's not what, how love is described in the Bible. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, when St. Paul is speaking about love, he makes it very clear. He says, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love does not excuse the sin. I can't say, oh, love, 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 and then peop I do whatever I want. I love God so much, but I'm going to do what I want. No, that's not how it works. And I'm not supposed to accept the wrongdoing in society. What am I seeking for other people? Am I truly giving them the image of Christ? One other nice example. St. Gregory the, the Wonder Worker, St. Gregory Thaumaturgus, that we mentioned in the liturgy. He was a bishop, Bishop of Neo Caesarea in the third century. And it says in his story that when he was ordained bishop, and he was actually ordained in his absence because he tried to refuse the position. But he was ordained and he came to Neo Caesarea and when he came to the city, there was only 17 Christians in the whole city. One seven. In the entire city. When he was on his deathbed, there were 17 who were not Christian. He turned the whole city upside down. And then some people take it after that, that even on, on his deathbed, even the rest, or at his funeral procession, the rest believed as well. This image of Christ is going to be attractive to some and unattractive to others. This is the reality. And in fact, Christ, he told this to the disciples from the very beginning. That some would hear them and some would not. Some would receive them and some would not. And in fact, he told them it wasn't very encouraging, but he told them that he was going to send them as lambs in the midst of wolves. But that was the reality. That was the reality. Some people are going to hear and some people are not going to hear. But it doesn't mean that I shouldn't present the whole package, the whole image of Christ. It shouldn't be because I didn't present Christ the right way. The important thing is, is if we go back when Christ, he asked the disciples in Matthew 16, he says, who do men say that I am? And this is some say it's on John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. This is the word on the street. This is kind of, you know, what CNN is saying and, you know, Fox News and whatever all the other news stations are saying. Okay, this is what everybody's saying. But then he asked them a second question. Who do you say that I am? It doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter. My opinion, my ideas, my beliefs should not be swayed or affected by what other people say. We have a truth. We have Christ. We don't need what other people say. They can say whatever they want. But we have a truth. And this shouldn't be shaken. He needs to be the center. He needs to be the foundation of my life. He needs to be that stability. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
None of those things are supposed to take us away from Christ. Don't let anything shake you. Be strong, be firm. That's why St. Paul, he says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. Don't let anybody shake your faith. Don't let anybody get you to believe something that is away from Christ, that takes you away from Him being the center of your life, and the foundation of your life, and your life. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work, the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Why? Because in that whole previous chapter, he was speaking about the resurrection to eternal life and the resurrection from the dead. In him, that he gave us the promise of through his own resurrection. We need to put him at the center of our life, our thoughts, our heart, our behavior, our deeds, our family, our school, our work, our relationships, our friends, our service, whatever it may be. He needs to be the center and the foundation, the son of righteousness who arises with healing in his wings. Glory to God forever.